I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, with uh, Act 3, Scene 2. Actually, I want to back up for just one moment, literally just one moment. Um, Act 3, Scene 1, where they're still at, at Glendower's place, we see one little scene, or, or one, three lines, between Hotspur and his wife that are reminiscent of it's almost like foreshadowing of something we will see with Hamlet and Ophelia. Hotspur says, line, I don't know, 223 or so following. Okay. This is on page 808. Uh, we get the, the um, stage direction. Mortimer, that's the Earl of March, that's Hotspur's brother-in-law, reclines with his head in his wife's lap. And Hotspur says, come, Kate, thou art perfect in lying down. Come quick, quick, that I may lay my head in thy lap. And she says, go ye get a goose and all. She kind of thinks he's playing games with her. Well, we're going to hear Hamlet talk about heads and laps in Hamlet quite a bit. Okay? Not quite a bit. He puns on it. Dirty jokes. Act 3, scene 2. The king comes in with the Prince of Wales and others. Now, if you ever get an opportunity to see this in production, if it's a good production, and if you have good actors playing um, the king and playing Harry or Hal, this can be the most amazing scene. Uh, I saw this once at the National Theater in London with, I can never remember his name, the guy who plays Argus Filch in the Harry Potter films. Anybody remember his name off the top of your head? He played Henry IV. Kind of old and scraggly, kind of like he looks in the Harry Potter films. And Matthew McFadden as Hal. At this point, I don't know if you're familiar with Matthew McFadden. Look him up on IMDb. You'll recognize him. At this point, he wasn't anybody. He was just kind of a no-name getting his start. And, man, they were superb. The guy who plays Filch is perfect for Henry IV. Okay? So they come in, King, Prince of Wales, and others. And the king says, Lords, give us leave. Why? Hal's about to get a dressing down. I mean, his, his father's going to take him to the woodshed. Prince of Wales and I must have some private conference, but be ne that is, stay just outside the doors, as it were. For we're going to have need of you. And so they all leave. I know not whether God will have it so, for some displeasing service I have done, that in his secret doom out of my blood he'll breed revengement and a scourge for me. That's not an auspicious beginning for Hal. I don't know if maybe God is going to bring out of my own heirs a revenge for me for something I've done. And he kind of acts like, for golly gee, what could I have done? Well, I don't know, to pose the previous king. But thou dost in thy passages of life make me believe that thou art only marked for the hot vengeance and the rod of heaven to punish my mistreatments. I kind of feel like you were born to be my punishment. Tell me else. Tell me I'm wrong, is what he's asking. Could such inordinate and low desires, such poor, such bare, such lewd, such Mean attempts, such barren pleasures, barren their meaning, empty, not producing anything long-lasting. Rude society, as thou art matched with all and grafted to. Grafted to means you have supplanted me, your real stock, with what? False staff. Look at the very name. Fall staff. A staff that's fallen. No longer upright. No longer strong. Accompany the greatness of thy blood and hold their level with thy princely heart. How? So what's he just said? What you just asked his son? Are, are you to be my death? I mean, that's really what he's getting at. Are you going to overthrow me? Are, are, are you God's punishment on me? Because look at who you're hanging around with. Look at what you're doing. 
so please, your majesty. I would I could quit all offenses with as clear excuse as well as I am. Doubtless I can purge myself of many I am charged with all. I would. I wish I desired that I could quit all offenses with a clear excuse. He's saying I can't. I can't clear them all. As well as I am doubtless, I can purge a lot that I'm accused of. In other words, there's a lot of stuff being said about me. Some of it's true. Some of it's not true. Yet such extenuation, let me beg you. Extenuation. Extenuating circumstances. There are, there are reasons okay, to help explain. As in reproof of many tales devised, which off the ear of greatness needs must hear by smiling pit things and base newsmongers. Man, you really wonder what Shakespeare would think about the news media today. I may for some things true, true, wherein my youth hath faulty wandered and irregular, find pardon of my true submission. That is, I can tell you some things that would, I hope, pardon me for some of my real faults. God pardoned thee. Notice, simple declarative statement. God pardoned you. Not, not a conditional if. Yet let me wonder, Harry. Wonder doesn't just mean I'm not sure. It can also mean, but I'm amazed, Harry, at thy affections, which do hold a wing quite from the flight of all thy ends. You don't behave like anybody in your family did. Not immediate family, not as younger brothers, but you don't behave like I did. You don't behave like my father did, John Gaunt. You don't behave like John of Gunn's father, Edward III, did. Right? Thy place in council thou hast really lost. That is the king's council. You should be one of my advisors. Which by thy younger brother is supplied. John, Duke of Lancaster. And art almost an alien to the hearts of all the court and princes of my The hope and expectation of thy time was ruined. What's that mean? The hope and expectation of thy time. Yeah, your time when you become king, people don't hope at all for you. They don't expect anything from you. And the soul of every man prophetic, prophetically do forthink thy so he tells how, how he won the affection of the people. This is kind of like a manual of statecraft. I don't know that you know political advisors tell the politicians they work for to do this, but they should, because this is brilliant. Listen to what he says. Had I so lavish of my presence been, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, so stale and cheap to vulgar company, okay, so lavish, so common, so stale, the so, 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 it's comparative. To what? To you. If I had been like you are, opinion, broadly generally conceived, no, public opinion. That did help me to the crown, had still kept loyal to possession. That is, to he who possessed the crown, Richard II, and left me in reputeless banishment, a fellow of no mark nor liking. If the people, back when I was just banished Bolingbroke, saw me as lavish in my presence as they see in you. So common, what is hackney? What's a hack writer? Because it's short for hackney. Hey. Yeah, or poor. Someone who just churns, I mean, the kind of novels you see at the checkout line in you know, grocery stores. They just churn out one after another, usually the same novel, okay? So stale and cheap to vulgar, vulgar, lower class, common company. 
He said, if I had been like that, then the public opinion would have still stayed with Richard. But, but always implies a contrast, a turn. Like a comet, I was wondering. Wondered, amazed. And comets, especially back in this period, always meant something. It's always a sign. Like a comet, I was wondered at that men would tell their children, this is he. Others would say, where? Which is Bolingbroke? Notice, this is he, and others would say, which one? Because they were so unfamiliar to see him. And then I stole all courtesy from heaven and dressed myself in such humility. I stole. He doesn't mean literally stole. He pretended to have heavenly manners. Humility. And did what? Dressed myself in such humility. That's the courtesy from heaven. But it's what? It's a dressing. If he dresses himself in it, what else can he do? Take it back off. It's not real humility. Okay? That I did pluck allegiance from men's hearts. Loud shouts and salutations from their mouths. Even in the presence of the crowned king. So even when... He and Richard were in the same room or in the same area. People were crying out, not long live the king, but they were calling out, Bullybrook, Bullybrook, Bull. Thus did I keep my person fresh and neat. Fresh, not worn out. He doesn't mean literally like I just took a shower before I came out to see him. And knew they weren't tired of seeing me. My presence, like a robe pontifical, like a pope's gown, ne'er seen but wondered at. And so my state, seldom but sumptuous, showed like a feast and won by rareness such solemnity. The skipping king. So that's what I was like. Now let me describe Richard. The skipping king. He ambled up and down with shallow gestures and rash bavin wits, soon kindled and soon burnt. Kindled, he started a flame, burned out quickly. Carded his state, mingled his royalty with capering fools, had his great name profaned with their scorns, gave his countenance against his name to laugh at jibing boys and stand the push of every beardless vein comparative. He's talking about the kinds of people Richard had at his, he, he kind of invited a lot of people. He made fun, almost, of his position. I don't mean to say that Richard belittled his position, but he didn't take his position seriously. He kind of was like the medieval pope who said, now that we have the papacy, I can't remember, one of the Medici's, now that we have the papacy, let's enjoy it. He grew a companion to the common streets and fiefed himself to popularity. In fief, he sold himself to popularity. That is, he did what he could to get popular. That, being daily swallowed by men's eyes, they surfeited with honey and began to loathe the taste of sweet. Or of a little more than a little is by much too much. A little more than a little, a little bit more than a little sweetness, too much. So you, you got to give the people just a tiny bit. So when he had occasion to be seen, when he wanted to be seen, what? He was but as the cuckoo is in June. You expect to see, England, you expect to see the cuckoo in June. In other words, when he wanted to be seen, everybody's like, yeah, there's Richard. Good deal. Heard, not regarded. He didn't pay any attention to him. Seen, but with such eyes as sick and blunted with immunity, afford no extraordinary gaze. 
such as is bent on sunlight of majesty, when it shines seldom in the mire of eyes. Now, it's not an accident that Henry uses that imagery, sun-like majesty, because how were we introduced to Prince Henry? Beginning of the play. His opening soliloquy. He knows he's the sun. And these are just the riffraff around him, or just the clouds, the base contagion, as he calls it. And he says, when I need to, I will dispel the clouds and I will shine and they'll go. Oh. Notice, notice, father and son think exactly alike. He puts on humility. Hal's doing what? He's putting on grime. He's putting on foulness. Okay? But rather drowsed and hung their eyelids down. Talk about Richard. Slept in his face and rendered such aspect as cloudy men used to their adversaries, being with his presence glutted, gorged, and full. And in that very line, Harry standest thou. That is, and you. Boy, you're going to be a Richard III, aren't you? Not literally. You're going to be just like Richard II was. For thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. Privilege. He means privilege in the way literary people talk about people being privileged today. Way up above everybody else. You've lost all that. How? Because people see him what? Coming in and out of whorehouses. Coming in and out of bars. Hanging around with a low life. Not an eye, but is weary of the common sight. He's kind of implying, you know, I've got people out there. I've got spies. And they're hearing what? The prince. The prince. The prince. Kind of, I think, I could be way wrong here. The way we won't talk about Charles, we'll talk about Charles and Mom. Queen Elizabeth had to think about Harry before he finally settled down. Prince Harry. Tabloids, him with hookers in Las Vegas. Tabloids with him with beautiful women. Various, various other places. She's got to be thinking about that. This kid's 31 years old. If anything happens to Charles, he'll be an old man. How old is he now? And he finally, you know, settles down, so to speak. Save mine. That is, you're not weary in my common sight. Why? Because I don't see you. <laughs> I've desired to see thee more. Which now doth that I would not have it do, make blind itself with foolish tenderness. That is, but now I blind my sight with foolish tenderness. I'm being too reasonable. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious Lord, be more myself. I'll be the real me. For all the world as thou art to this hour was Richard. And so he makes clear that Hal understands. Was Richard then when I from France set foot at Ravensburg? But then he kind of thrusts the metaphorical knife and twists it. And even as I was then is Percy now. You're like Richard. What's he saying? He's not saying Hotspur should be king. He's saying Hotspur is going to be king if you're not careful, because Hotspur is going to win what? He's going to win the people's favor. Now, upon my scepter. That's, a, that's an oath, by the way. <laughs> He's swearing by the greatest thing he can swear by. And my soul to boot, he hath more worthy interest to the state than thou the shadow of succession. He deserves to be king. For of no right nor color like to right, he doth fill fields with harness in the realm. That is, when Hotspur marches out and he calls for people to come to his side, they go willingly. He can raise an army. What kind of army is Henry and Hell is going to raise. Hmm. Not, a Not a very or strong one. 
He turns head against the lion's armored jaws. The lion's armored jaws, that's Henry. You know, the royal seal has two things on it. It's got a unicorn and a lion. Like a lion. The unicorn, if I remember correctly, comes from the unification with the Welsh house. So, being no more in debt to years than thou. At Shakespeare's reducing the age of Hotspur to make him the same age as Hal. He leads ancient lords and reverend bishops on to bloody battles and to bruising arms. Notice, he leads, not he's led by. What never dying honor hath he got against renowned Douglas? The very name Douglas implies in kind of English mythology, you know, along with the Scots, mighty warrior. And in fact, Douglas is usually referred to as the Douglas, like the champion, whose ideas, whose hot encouragement, blah, 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 blah. Okay? He goes on and talks about Hotspur. Thrice hath this Hotspur Mars in swaddling clothes. He's like a baby god of war. This infant warrior in his prices, enterprises discomfited great Douglas. He's thrice defeated Douglas, taken him once, enlarged, freed him, and made a friend of him, to fill the mouth of deep defiance up and shake the peace and safety of our throne. What's the purpose of this part of his speech? What's he saying to Hal? Hotspur is in open rebellion. And he's got the Douglas on his side. And wherever he goes, people come out and flock to him. What's the purpose? The purpose of the conversation is not simply to dress down Hal. It's to inform him. Why? Because Hal's not been around for months at the, prince, at the king's council. He doesn't know what's going on. So he's saying, oh, it's bad. Here's how bad it is. And, and what say you to this? So, it's not just Hotspur, Percy, that's Hotspur, Northumberland, the Archbishop of York, Douglas, Mortimer, capitulate against us and are up. Capitulate. It means they form a head against us. This, this isn't a minor rebellion. Northumberland is one of the most powerful dukes in all the land, has one of the largest estates. The Northumberlands, if I remember correctly, were one of the groups that probably sided with Philip II of Spain against Elizabeth and might have been involved in or were involved in the Spanish Armada. Okay. The wherefore do I tell you thee? These news to thee. Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my troubles, which art my nearest and dearest thing? That is, not my enemy to you. You are the worst enemy I have. Thou that art like enough to vassal fear, base inclination, and the starkest gloom to fight against me under Percy's. do I now do address to dog his heels and curtsy at his frowns, that is to do what he asks to show how much thou art a gentleman and how's like whoa stop time out that's too far that's a low blow do not think so simple short declarative you shall not find it so. Do not think so. Don't imagine it so. Why? It's how it's not going to be. And God forgive them that so much has swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from it. Who are they going to pay? And how is going to kind of lay out the marker for what he's going to do. I will redeem all this on Percy's head. Redeem. I will purchase back 
all the bad stuff said about me, how? On Percy's head implies, yeah, you're going to kill him, but when I bring you Percy's head. So when I bring you Hotspur's head, everything that you thought about me before, that should pretty much cancel it all out. And in the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son. When I will wear a garment all of blood and stain my favors in a bloody mass, which washed away shall scour my shame with it. When, after that glorious day, I wash all the grime of war, all the grime of what came before the war, also be cleansed away. And that shall be the day, whenever it comes, whenever it lights, that this same child of honor and renown. Notice, honor and renown, those are the parents of Hotspur. Honor and fame. This gallant Hotspur, this all praised knight. Okay. But how he's going on about Hotspur, you know, oh, Henry got to him. He struck a sore nerve. And you're unthought of, Harry. Unthought of. No fame, no renown, no honor. Chance to meet. For every honor sitting on his helm, they were multitudes. And on my head, my shame's redouble. For the time will come that I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. Wow. I mean, obviously not literally. So how are they going to exchange glorious deeds for indignities? Yeah. <laughs> but how does that exchange them? And if he is full of indignities now, the people think, oh, he's a slouch. He's a slacker. And the slacker kills the very theme of honor's tongue. Well, there must have been more to that than slacker. Percy is but my factor, good my lord. That is, I will multiply by him. Shakespeare loves all kinds of different metaphors. I will, uh, he's but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf. And I will call him to so strict account that he shall render every glory up, yet even the slightest worship of his time, or I will tear the reckoning from its heart. This, notice, not by your silly little scepter, in the name of God, I will promise here. Well, that's, again, that's an oath. And assuming for the moment he believes in the power of his oath and in God, he's saying, God help. Obviously, if he loses... God didn't help him. God said, nope. And if he wins, ah, God favors me. In the name of God, I promise here, the which, if he be pleased, notice the qualification, if God is pleased with what I've said, I shall perform. I do beseech your majesty may set the long-grown wounds of my intemperance. If not, the end of life canceled all bonds. That is, when I die, all debts are paid, and I will die a hundred thousand deaths ere break the smallest part of parcel of this vow. Hen Henry, a hundred thousand rebels die in this. Thou shalt have charge and sovereign trust herein. May a hundred thousand rebels die because of your words. He's not saying that literally. I think what he really means is your words are as good to me as a hundred thousand deaths. Hell, you don't know what ease you've put my heart into. So Blunt comes in. And Blunt tells him, Mortimer, Douglas, etc., the English rebels, they're met at Shrewsbury. Okay. So the king says, all right, here's what we're going to do. Earl of Westmoreland set forth today with him my son, Lord John of Lancaster, second in line after Hal. Notice, he's already marching to war. He's not very old. He's in his early teens. Right? On Wednesday next, Harry, you shall set forward 
Thursday, we ourselves will march. Our meeting is Bridge North here. You shall march to Gloucestershire, by which account our business value in some 12 days hence, our general forces of Bridge North Hill. So we get 3-3. Three, 3-2 three. Three, is a pretty serious scene, right? 3 th Shakespeare says, we need a little levity. we got to turn it down a bit. Okay? So, uh, we see Falstaff come in with Bardo, Bardolph and Peto and such. The prince comes in, and beginning 148 and following, Falstaff says, now 146, how thou knowest as our but man, I dare, but as our prince, I fear thee as I fear the roaring of the lion's whelp. As prince, I fear you as I fear the roaring of what's meant by whelp? Kitten. Think Simba. <laughs> Not very scary. That's what Falstaff is saying. I don't fear you. Why? Because of the very thing Henry was talking about in that whole speech. You are too commonly among them, and you have lost your glory and majesty. Prince, why not as the lion? Why don't you fear me as the lion? Because the king himself is to be feared as the lion. Dost thou think I'll fear thee as I fear thy father? Nay! I'm not going to fear you as I fear your father. That means two different things. Now, and the implication is, and when you are king, I won't fear you as I fear your father. Why? Because Falstaff thinks he has the prince in his back pocket. He thinks he's best buds. Oh! When Falstaff says, and I do, that is, and if I do fear you like that, I pray God my girdle break. That is, kill me now. Oh, if it should, how would thy guts fall about thy knees? But, sir, there's no room for faith, truth, nor honesty in this bosom of thine. It is all filled up with guts and midriff. Faith, truth, honesty are all what? Virtues. You have no virtues. Why? Because you are a fat slob. Charge an honest woman with picking thy pocket, while thou whore some impudent and embossed rascal, if there were anything in thy pocket but tavern reckoning memorandums of body houses and one poor penny worth of sugar candy to make thee long-winded, if thy pocket were enriched with any other injuries but these, I am a villain. Will you not stand to it? You will not pocket up law. Art thou not ashamed? Dost thou hear how thou knowest? In the state of innocency, Adam fell. Adam was innocent. He had not yet experienced evil, and yet he fell. And what should poor Jack Falstaff do in the days of villainy? What does Falstaff just appeal to? Evil's rampant in the world. I mean, Adam fell when the world was perfect and innocent. I'm no Adam. Okay. So, the prince gives letters to them. These are letters of what? These are charges. These are commissions. Go bear this letter to Lord John of Lancaster, 194 or so, to my brother John, this to my lord of Westmoreland, so Bardolph reads. He gives Peto. Go, Peto, to horse, to horse, for thou and I have thirty miles to ride. To Falstaff, Jack, meet me tomorrow in the Temple Hall at two o'clock in the afternoon. There shalt thou know thy charge, and there receive money and order for their furniture. That is, for their furnishings. There who? The people, Falstaff will be charged to raise, to fight for them. So he's going to give Falstaff a sack of money to buy armor and armament and to buy or pay people to join in the war. Okay. Act 4. So we see Douglas and uh, Falstaff, and Douglas calls him, line 10, Thou art the king of honor. No man so potent breathes upon the ground, but I will that is, and if anyone who says they're better than you, I'll pluck his beard, which was an offensive act. Okay. So Hotspur and the messenger go back and forth. And what do they 
here, what does Hotspur read? He reads this letter, and we're told. Um, Hotspur, line 21. Doth he keep his bed? Who's the he Hughes? His father, Northumberland. Huge army Northumberland is. Is he sick in bed? Four days ago, when I left, yep, he was. Much feared by his physicians. Oh, line 25. I would the state of time had first been whole, ere he by sickness had been visited. His health was never better worth than now. Oh, uh, Hotspur is saying, I wish we'd done what we need to do before he got sick. We really need my father in full form, full vigor. Sick? Now, droop now. His sickness doth infect the very lifeblood of our enterprise. In other words, if we don't have Northumberland to help us, we are woefully outnumbered. This this will be hard to pull off. Tis catching hither even to our king. Does that mean literally people in the camp? Are falling sick? Or does it mean people are kind of dragging heavy weights? <clears throat> he writes me here that inward sickness, and that his friends by deputation, could not so soon be gone, nor did he think it meet to lay so dangerous a gear trust on any soul removement on his own. Yet doth he give us bold advertisement that with our small conjunction we should on. With our small co-joining, that is, our small armies joined together, you can do it, Hotspur. For as he writes, there is no quailing now. No stopping. Ball's already been set in the motion. Because the king is certainly possessed of all our vermin. Because the king knows what's our plan of war. Worcester, your father's sickness is a maim. Maim. What's, what's the difference between a maim and a wound? If you're maimed, you're halt, you're limping. You're you're you can't go on. A wound can be, you know, just a flesh wound. <laughs> Sorry, my Python illusion there. Potsburg. A perilous it's not just a maiming, more more money python. A perilous gash, a very limb lopped off. But it's not. Why not? What's Hotspur latch onto? What idea does he grasp at? Faith. Louder? Faith. What kind of faith? Faith in God? Faith in himself? What's he say? If we get victory maimed, oh, how great would that victory be? In um, Henry V, Henry V, there's a very famous battle account of the Battle of Agincourt. And if I remember correctly the numbers, I always get these wrong. Battle of Agincourt, it's something like English, 5,000 uh, French, 60,000. And the English are not there. Hugely outnumbered. But the English won because they had the English longbows. Longbows, you know, you could fly, you pierce armor. Could you fire them way up in the air? And so the force of the firing plus gravity can pierce armor. English won a huge, huge victory. That's what he's getting at. Were it good to set the exact wealth of all our states all at one cast? That is, should we bring all our forces together at once? To set so rich a man on the nice hazard of one doubtful hour? Should we roll everything, you know, when Henry might not have such a great force? No. Douglas, yeah, yeah, we should. Hotspur, a rendezvous, a home to fly unto, if that the devil and his chance look big upon the maiden head of our affairs. Worcester, yeah, but I still wish your father were here. Quality and hair of our attempt brooks no division. That is, no dividing as well as what's implied by division. United we stand. It will be thought by some that know not why he is away, is away, 
wisdom, loyalty, and mere dislike of our proceedings. Some people are going to say, he's not that sick. He realizes this is all he's been. And he is showing what Falstaff is later going to call discretion. Think how such an apprehension may turn the tide of fearful faction, breed a kind of question in our cause. And if the Lord Northumberland is having second thoughts, who else might have second thoughts? Cotsworth, nah, you strain too far. You're taking this too far. Men must think if we without his help can make a head to push against the kingdom with his help, we shall overturn it topsy turvy down. We're fine, okay? So Vernon comes in. So the first messenger comes in bearing news of Northumberland's not coming. Now Vernon comes in. And Hotspur says, welcome. Pray God my news be worth the welcome, Lord. The Earl of Westmoreland, 7,000 strong, is marching hitherwards. With him, Prince John. No harm. What more? What more means... Literally, what more news, what else? But it could also mean anybody else marching against us. Come on, we can take them on with us. Bring it on. Well, okay. Uh, further, I've learned the king himself in person is sent forth. See, that's unusual. Why? You want the king to stay back so that the king is not killed in battle. The king coming forth means we're unleashing everything. Or hitherwards intended speedily. Hotspur, he shall be welcome to bring it on. Where's his son? Well, we already know John, Duke of Lancaster, is coming. That's not the one he's asking about. Where is his son? The nimble-footed madcap Prince of Wales. Nimble-footed, dancing. That implies he's known as someone who dances a lot. Or maybe not dances, but maybe the nimble-footed is like a drunken stupor, stumbling. And his comrades, Falstaff, Bardolf, Peel, Wands, etc., that doffed the world aside and bid it pass. They doffed the world aside, meaning what? They don't care what that is. Like, eh, it's not my problem. Vernon, oh, oh yeah, I forgot. The young Prince of Wales, all furnished, all in arms, all plumed like estrogens, that with the wind bolted, excuse me, baited like eagles, having lately bathed, glittering in golden coats, like images as full of spirit as is the month of May, and gorgeous as the sun at midsummer, wanton as youthful goats, wild as young bulls, I saw young Harry. See, the young bulls finishes the sentence. And then he says, I saw young Harry. The way Shakespeare creates it, it's almost like everything before that, oh, that, that's the prince. He is like a young bull, a young goat. He's like the sun has anointed him. With his beaver on, that is his helmet on, his creases on his thighs, his armament, his metal armor on his thighs, gallantly on, rise from the ground like feathered mercury. Well, who is mercury? Messenger of the gods. In other words, he's coming with a message. And vaulted with such ease into his seat as if an angel dropped down from the clouds to turn and wind a fiery pegasus. That is to give wind to in which the world with noble people. Which there means bewitch, to enchant the world with noble people. You haven't seen a man on horseback like this man. Hotspur, stop, stop, stop. Worse than the sun in March, this praise doth nourish agues. It makes me sick. Let them come. They come like sacrifices in their trim. In their trim, in all their decking. Because you don't just take a sacrifice you know, in what they're normally wearing. No, you dress them up, you put robes on, and you put incense and such around them. He's saying, these are sacrifices coming to the slaughter. 
to the fire-eyed maid of smoky war, all hot and blue will we offer them. The mailed mar shall on his altar sit up to the ears in blood. I am on fire. Okay. Vernon. Oh, more news. So I forgot. Um, because Hotspur says, oh man, I wish Glendower were here. We would wreak havoc on them. Oh, oh yeah, forgot. Glendower can't come. Uh, two weeks. Douglas. That's the worst tidings I've ever heard of yet. Forster. That bears a frosty sound. What may the king's whole battle reach out to? How many men does the king have? Uh, 30,000. My father and Glendower are both being away. The powers of us may serve so great a day. Come, let it. He's not named Hotspur accidentally, right? He wants to kill. Okay. So, 4 2. Falstaff comes in with Bardolph. And Falstaff describes, lines 14 and following, the kind of men he has raised to be in charge of. I press me, and he's talking about the British practice of impressing, also sometimes just called pressing, where soldiers would go into a town and they'd go into the local pub, and anybody that was there, any males that were there, the Marines would jump, put them in shackles and irons, for the Navy at least, and take them off to the nearest naval ship, and you're now a member of the Navy. Even if you're a freeborn person. Called pressing. So, Falstaff presses people. He forces them into fighting for the king. But who does he force? I press me none but good householders, yeoman sons, inquiring me out contracted, that is, to be married bachelors. Such has been asked twice on the bands, that is, the bands had been read twice in church. There's only one more Sunday and then the marriage. Such a commodity of warm slaves as had is like here the devil as a drum, such a spirit of report. I press me none but such toast and butter with hearts in their bellies no bigger than pins heads, blah, 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 blah. Slaves as ragged as Lazarus in the painted cloth. The painted cloth, Lazarus in his winding clothes when Christ called him out of his tomb. In other words, these guys aren't very fit and hardy. Okay? Where the glutton's dog licked his sores and such as indeed, uh, sorry, different Lazarus. This is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. This is the poor Lazarus who doesn't even have many clothes. Okay? Lying at the rich man's gate. And such have I, line 31, to fill up the rooms of them as have bought out their services, that you would think that I had 150 tattered prodigals lately come from swine keeping, parable of the prodigal son, and press the dead bodies. No eye has seen such scarecrows. I'll not march through Coventry with them, that's flat. Nay, and the villains march wide betwixt the legs, as if they had jives on, for indeed I had the most of them out of prison. He's got the dregs of humanity. Prince comes in with Westmoreland. Okay. And they talk about the kinds of people that Falstaff has impressed. Westmoreland, line 67. But Sir John, methinks they are exceeding poor and bare, too beggarly. Too beggarly. He doesn't mean these aren't the finest, these aren't the chosen. He means they don't even have enough food in their belly. You can't expect these men to fight. Faith for their poverty. That is, they're beggarly for their poverty. I know not where they had that. I don't know why they're poor. And for their bareness, I, they didn't get that from me. No, but I'll be sworn, unless you call three fingers in the rib bear. But, sir, make haste. Percy's already in the field. Is the king encamped? He is, Sir John. I fear we shall stay too long. Okay? 4-3. Hotspur, Vernon, Douglas, Worcester, etc., talking again. And in blunt comes, line 32 and following. 
One comes with an offer from the king. Why is the king making an offer? Is it because he's afraid he's going to lose? I come with gracious offers from the king if you about safety, hearing, and respect. If you will show me respect, and if you will listen to my offer, possibly, you're welcome. Come on in. Oh, man, I wish you were on our side. That's what would to God you were of our determination is. We could use you. Some of us love you well. And even though some envy your great deserving and good name because you are not of our quality, but stand against us. And some of us even respect you because you're not one of us. Okay? What? says, the king hath sent to know, 43, the nature of your griefs and whereupon you conjure from the breast of civil peace such bold hostility, teaching this his duties land audacious cruelty. What's your problem? What's the cause? If that the king have any way your good deserts forgot, that is, if the king has forgotten to bestow some grace upon you, which he confesses, your good deserts are manifold. That is, the things you've done in the past that are great or many. He bids you name your griefs. With all speed, you shall have your desires with interest and pardon absolute for yourself and these herein misled by your suggestion. If your complaints have merit, he will remedy them and you will be pardoned. The king is kind. Well, we know the king knows at what time to promise when to pay. What does Hotspur mean? Um, we have the account that says something in there that means that the king already has the account. Yes, that's what it means on its literal. Yeah, he, he realizes that he's about to lose and that the king already has The subtext is Hotspur is saying that the king's promises are really not the problem. He's saying he'll promise peace, he'll promise payment, and then then he's going to kill us. My father and my uncle and myself did give him that same loyalty he wears. But when he was not six and twenty strong, sick in the world's regard, that is when he was banished, wretched and low, a poor and minded outlaw sneaking home, my father gave him welcome to the shore. A poor, unwelcome outlaw. Why? He'd been banished. He came back before the banishment was over. He was still outlaw. And my father welcomed him. Okay, keep in mind who his father is. Northumberland, one of the most powerful men of the realm. He came but to be Duke of Lent. He came to request his dukedom. To sue his livery, that is to get his livelihood, beg his peace with tears of innocence, terms of deal. My father in kind heart and pity moved, swore him assistant, performed it too. When the lords and barons of the realm perceived Northumberland did lean to him, they all lean to him. In other words, he wouldn't be king if it weren't but for my father. Okay? He presently, line 76, as greatness knows itself, steps me a little higher than his vow. That is, once he realized all these people were lending their aid to him, he goes above his vow. His vow was, I just want my land and title made to my father while his blood was poor. He takes on him to reform some certain edicts, great decrees, etc. Cries out abuses. And then he cuts me off the heads of all the favorites that the absent king and deputation left behind him. And he did. Guys named Bushy and Green and one other one whose name I can't remember. That is, what, what Hotspur is saying here is true. He's not lying. Bolingbroke did go beyond what he said he wanted. He had no legal authority to kill those favorites of the king. Blunt, that's not what I'm here for. Okay, well, let me get to the point. In short, he deposed the king. Soon after that, deprived him of his life. And in the neck of that task, the whole state. To make that worse, he suffered his kinsman. March, that is Mortimer, Hotspur's brother-in-law, who... The previous king, Richard, said, is next in line. He suffered him to be engaged in Wales. That is, he sent him to fight Glendower. 
Osprey saying he knew Glendower was deceased. He disgraced me and my happy victories, blah, 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 blah. Boy, so this is your answer? No, no. We'll withdraw a while. Go to the king. 4-4. Four, four. So the Archbishop of York comes in. And he says to Sir Michael, uh, pick up with line... 10. Excuse me. For Sir at Shrewsbury, as I am truly given to understand, the king with mighty and quick rage of power meets with Lord and Harry. Excuse me. That's Hotspur. And I fear, Sir Michael, what with the sickness of Northumberland, whose power was in the first proportion, and what with Glendower's absent friends, who with them was arrayed in sinew too, comes not and overruled their prophecies, I fear the power of Percy is too weak to wage an instant trial. Okay. Sir Michael says, yeah, but there's more to inquire. And Vernon, and Hotspur, and Worcester, there's, there's a ton of gallant noble gentlemen. You're right, there is, Archbishop replies. But the king hath drawn the special head of all the reign together. The special, the choicest. The Prince of Wales, what? How's the Prince of Wales considered the choicest? I mean, because 20 minutes ago, he was a slouch, seemingly. Lord John of Lancaster, the noble Westmoreland, the warlike one, and many others. All right. 5 1. King. Bloodily, the sun begins to peer upon yon bosky hill. The sun is starting to rise, and it's a red sun. That means there will be blood. So he and the prince speak, and Worcester and Vernon come in. Why? Blunt made an embassage to Hotspur's troops. Now, Worcester and Vernon come back to deliver their decision. Notice Blunt doesn't go back to hear what they say. The king. How now, my lord of Worcester? Tis not well that you and I should meet upon such terms as now we do. You have deceived our trust, made us doff our easy robes of peace to crush our old limbs in our gentle steel. This is not well. Tell me, what do you say? Hear me, my liege. By saying my liege, he's still acknowledging the king as his lord. For mine own part, I could be well content to entertain the lag end of my life. In other words, Worcester and the king are about the same age, and they're both going, damn it, I'm old. Why do you make me put on arms? I would like to die in bed, too. I protest I have not sought the day of this dislike. The day of this dis-ease. Really? How comes it then? Because really, what the king has said, even earlier, who's really behind the rebellion? It's not Hotspur. Worcester. Worcester is the one who's been putting the ideas in everybody's mind. Falstaff. <laughs> Rebellion lay in his way and he found it. Peace. I would shut up. I'm not walking around. If it pleased, it pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favor from myself and all our house. Okay, so here's our gripe. You don't acknowledge us. You don't give us the respect we deserve. And yet I must remember that is remind you, my lord, we were the first and dearest of your friends. For you, my staff of office, did I break in Richard's time. Posted day and night to meet you on the way. Kiss your hand. Big long speech. So he says that even, line 63, <coughs> our love durst not come near your sight for fear of swallowing, but with nimble wing we were enforced for safety's sake to fly out of your sight and raise this present head, this head of rebellion, whereby we stand opposed by such means as you yourself have forged against yourself. King, you've spoken well. These things, indeed, you have articulated, proclaimed at market crosses, read in churches, Face the garment of rebellion with some fine color that may be 
please the eye of fickle changelings of the poor discontents. This is just some of what you have said. To do what? To persuade the people. You've said it where? Market crosses. There's literal crosses in markets, kind of like free speech zones. People come to listen. You've read it in churches, etc. To please the eye of fickle changelings, poor discontents, which gape and rub the elbow at the news of hurly burly innovation. Hurly burly innovation. Innovation. If something's innovative, it's what? It's new. The MTSU's got this redesigning general ed going on. One of the buzzwords they use all throughout this document, which is weird. It's innovative. As if what is new is always and necessarily better. Okay? But he calls it hurly burly. That is without rhyme or reason. It's merely caught up in the moment. Never yet did insurrection want such watercolors to impaint his cause. That is, insurrection uses watercolors to do what? To paint broad strokes. What's he saying? What are the particulars? And so the prince addresses. This is how. Even though John of Lancaster is a prince, whenever prince, it's how. In both your armies, there is many a soul shall pay full dearly for this encounter, if once they join in trial. What's Hal saying? A lot of men are going to die on both sides. Tell your nephew. Who's his nephew? Who's Worcester's nephew? Hotspur. The Prince of Wales does join with all the world in praise of Henry Percy. Tell, tell Hotspur, <laughs> by my hopes this present enterprise set off his head, I do not think a braver gentleman, more active, valiant, more valiant, young, more daring, or more bold, is now alive to grace this latter age with noble deeds. There's not anybody as heroic and honorable as Henry Percy. Kind of my hat off to him. As for me, speaking to my shame, I have a truant bent to chivalry. Truant. What's it mean to be truant? Absent. Arrive late. I'm a late arrival to chivalry. Chivalry, the whole honor code. And so I hear he doth account me too. So I praise him. I've been late or absent from chivalry. In and word has reached me that he also thinks I've been late to chivalry. Yet this, before my ma father's majesty, that is, here's an offering, before my father, I am content he shall take the odds of his great name and estimation, and will, to save the blood on either side, try fortune with him in a single fight. Let Hotspur and I come out, single battle, everybody on both sides watch, What's the, what's the offer? Whoever wins, that side wins. I kind of imagine that immediately the king's going, no, what? <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> and Prince of Wales, so dare we venture thee. Well, something's happened between 4-1 and now. The king now believes what? Albeit considerations infinite do make against it. No, good Worcester. No. No. We love our people well, even those we love that are misled upon your cousin's part. That is, we even love the people that are in that other army that are misled by you and Hotspur. If you guys will take our offer of grace, both he and they and you, yea, every man shall be my friend again and I'll be his. So tell your cousin, bring me word, that if he will not yield, rebuke and dread correction, wait on us. That is, rebuke and dread correction are waiting for us to what? To bring it. 
We will bring rebuke and correction, and they shall do their office. You will die. So Worcester leaves. Prince, now yeah, they're not going to take it. Douglas and Hotspur both together are confident against the world in arms. King, all right, everyone go to your places. So we see Falstaff and Hal. Falstaff says, man, I wish it were bedtime. And all well. Hal, why? Thou owest God a death. Well, death is often spoken of as what? So-and-so fell asleep in the room. Rest in peace is rest, right? The prince says, you owe God a death. Okay? He leaves. False death gets a soliloquy. What's he talk about? Tis not due yet. I'm not ready to die yet. I'd be loath to pay him before his day. What need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Well, it's just a matter. Honor pricks me on. Yeah, but what if honor pricked me off when I come on? That is, what if somebody else's honor kills me when I come on? How then can honor set to a leg? No. An arm? That is, can honor set a leg? Can honor set an arm? Broken leg, broken leg? No. Can it take away the grief of a wound? No. Have honor no skill in surgery? No. Well, what the hell is honor? What is that honor? Air. Because literally, honor is composed of what? Air coming out of your lungs. A trim reckoning. Who hath it? Who hath honor? He that died on Wednesday? That is, if he died on Wednesday, does he feel honor today? No. Does he hear it? No. Tis insensible then. Insensible. Two meanings to that word. One, it cannot be sensed by the one who has died. Also, insensible means nonsense. It has no sense to it. Yea, to the dead. But will it not live with the living? Won't honor live on with the living? No. Why? Detraction will not suffer it. Detraction, somebody else's honor, will not suffer somebody else having more honor. Therefore, I'll none of it. Honor is a mere escutcheon. What's an escutcheon? Hardly any of you have an escutcheon. An escutcheon is like, you know, The Nike swoosh. It's a symbol, right? What's it mean? It means Nike. What's Nike mean? Ah, it's a big term. Honor is merely something you put on as symbolic. And so ends my catechism. What's a catechism? It's a teaching of some kind of religious truth or dogma. Falstaff's telling us here, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not merely mincing words. This, this is what, what does honor get you? Death. 5-2. Worcester and Vernon come in, okay? Worcester, my nephew must not know Sir Richard. For liberal and kind offer of money. Uh, that's where best he did. In other words, we should. Be honest diplomats, to be honest ambassadors, we should relate what the king said. Then we are all undone. No, no, we can't. We can't. It is not possible. It cannot be the king should keep his word in loving us. He will suspect us still and find a time to punish this offense and other faults. Suspicion all our lives shall be stuck full of eyes. For treason is but trusted like the fox. He says, we can't tell Hotspur why, because I don't trust the king. Well, the distrustful are ever distrustful of others. The unhonorable are ever unhonorable to others. Okay? My nephew's trespasses, line 15 and following, may be well forgot. He might absolve Hotspur. 
it hath the excuse of youth and heat of life. He might excuse it. Why? Because he's young. He's hot-headed. People who are often, people are often young and hot-headed when they're in their 20s. And then what happens? They mellow out. And an adopted name of privilege, a harebrained Oxford governed by spleen, all his offenses live upon my head and his father's. He might let Hotspur live, but me, Percy, uh -uh. Vernon, the king, just do what Percy tells you. Okay. So they go and they tell Hotspur. And Worcester said, oh, by the way, the Prince of Wales challenged you to single combat. Oh, Hotspur, line 47. Would the quarrel lay upon our heads and that no man might draw from short breath today, but I and Harry might cut it. Tell me, how short is Taft? Seemed to them to, that is, was he saying this jokingly? Was he saying this contemptuously of me? Vernon, ooh, by my soul. I never in my life did hear a challenge urged more modestly. Unless a brother should a brother dare to gentle exercise and prove mind. He gave you all the duties of a man, trimmed up your prince, trimmed up. That is, he ornamented, he arranged your praises with a princely tongue. Spoke your deservings like a chronicle, making you ever better than his praise by still dispraising praise valued with you. He dispraised himself and elevated you. And which became him like a prince indeed, he made a blushing sidle of himself and chid his truant youth with such a grace as if he mastered their double spirit of teaching and learning instantly. Let me tell the world if he outlived the envy of this day, that is, if you die and he lives, England did never owe so sweet a hope, so much misconstrued in his wonders. What did the king say? There is little hope and expectation of you. Vernon now says, if he outlives this day, England will never have a greater hope because people misconstrued his wantonness. They didn't understand it. The Hotspur's line. Bromance, I take your love with him. You think thou art enamored on his follies, right? So, 5-3 and 5-4, we see fighting going on. We see Hotspur, Douglas, etc. We see the Prince and Falstaff. The Prince runs into Falstaff. In five, at the end of 5.3, says, lend me thy sword. Okay. And he reaches in for Falstaff's sword and pulls out of his scabbard what looks like a sword hilt, but it's not. It's a bottle of sack. Excuse me, from his pistol. It's a bottle of sack. And how? Is it a time to jest? 5.4. We see the king and Lancaster and the prince and such, and then Hotspur and Hal meet each other. 63. If I mistake not, doubt, you know, look. Middle of battle, they're both covered in blood and gore. If I mistake thee not, thou art Harry, Prince of Monmouth. You know, very English, right? Thou speakst as if I would deny my love. Well, why does he say that? Are there multiple Prince of Monmouths? Running around the battlefield? No. There are multiple King Henrys. There are multiple men dressed as the king. My name is Harry Percy. Why, then I see a very valiant rebel of that name. I am the Prince of Wales, and think not Percy to share with me in glory anymore. That is blah, 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 blah. They fight. Falstaff comes in. Douglas comes in. He fights with Falstaff, who falls as he did. And how kills Percy. Oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. All my glory, all my honor now is yours. They wound my thoughts. Oh, I could prophesy, lines 83 and following, but that the earthly cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust and food for it. Monty Python. 
And how finishes his words? Shakespeare loves this image. He uses it repeatedly in food for four words. Brave Isaac, fare thee well, great heart. Ill weaved, fare thee well. That could be taken as hell saying, may God not hold thee this against you. Fare thee well means, may your soul receive well. Ill weaved ambition, how much art thou shock. This is where ill weaved ambition will get you. When that this body did contain a spirit, what? A kingdom for it was too small. Now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears the dead bears not alive so stout. He's praising him. Greater courage, not alive. If thou wert sensible of courtesy, I should not make so certain. If you were still alive, I wouldn't be talking like this. But let my favors hide thy mangled face. And what does he do? He pulls the scarf off that has his heraldic emblem of the Prince of Wales. And covers. Hotspur's body. Sign of respect. Sign of honor. And then he sees Falstaff. Old acquaintance could not all this flesh keep in a little life. Again, Falstaff needs to be grossly, oh, grotesquely fat. Come on. You're so, there should be a little bit of life there. But nope. I could have spared a better man. Oh, I should have a heaviness of thee, punning on heavy, if I were much in love with vanity. If I were really vain, I would miss you even more. Why? Because false death feeds his vanity. What's he saying? I'm not vain. I'm not going to miss you that much. I am going to miss you, but... And he leaves, and false death gets up. He sees Percy... He thinks, maybe Percy's like I am. Maybe he's more twisted. <clears throat> and so he stabs him. Okay. Prince comes back in. Falstaff says, I swear I killed him. Prince says, no, I didn't. Prince says, no, you didn't. I did. He says, yeah, but he got up after it. He's like, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll let you take the armor. 5-5. Five, five. Thus ever did rebellion find rebuke. Ill-spirited Worcester. Notice Worcester lives. Did not we send grace, pardon, and terms of love to all of you? And wouldst thou turn our offers contrary? Misuse the tenor of thy kinsman's trust. He's saying Hotspur is dead. Why? Because you misused his trust. Three knights upon our party slain today. A noble earl, many creature else have been alive this hour. If, like a Christian, thou hadst truly borne betwixt our army's true intelligence. That tells us, word has reached Henry, Vernon in Worcester did not report truly what was offered to Hotspur. What I have done, my safety urged me. And I embrace this fortune patiently, since not to be avoided it. He goes, you're right. Take him to death. Vernon too. The other offenders we will pause upon. That is, we're not going to kill them yet. We might show them grace. We might show them mercy. How goes the field? Douglas, when he saw the fortune of the day quite turned from him, the noble priest he slain, and all his men upon the foot of fear fled with the rest. Okay. So, John of Lancaster is going to go chase him down. To you this honorable bounty shall belong. Go to the Douglas, deliver him up to his pleasure, ransom list and free, blah, 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 blah. So the king says, and we'll stop with this, and I'll, I'll make just one or two comments about Henry II, since we're not, we're not doing Henry II, right? We're going straight to Henry V. This remains, we divide our power, you son John and my cousin Westmoreland, towards York, shall bend you with your dear speed to meet Northumberland in the prelate scoop. Scroop, that's the Archbishop of York, who, as we hear, are busily in arms, myself and you, son Harry, will go towards Wales to fight with Glendower and the Earl of March. In other words, 
The play ends. Battle, man. Henry the Second, Part Two opens, and there's still battle, but the bad guys have been caught, and some of the armies are still fleeing. And we have Prince John of Lancaster swear to a whole group. Okay, if you throw down your arms, we'll grant you clemency. They do. They start to disperse their troops, and he turns and slaughters them. He swears on his royal blood. But he's not the king. He's the prince. He's not the prince next in line to be the king. Hal is. Right? So, in that play, we see Henry die. Henry IV die. And Hal become king. Henry V opens shortly thereafter. Hal has not been king for very long, and the king of France is challenging him. Right? And that's where kind of Henry V opens. All right. We will stop there. And we are doing Henry V, right? Yeah. Sorry, my brain is... I think I've got a fever. It feels not with me. Just like, you know, I said, I think if they cheat for you, like they cheat on you, like 